Hi, my name is Jeff and I'm an instructor at PinCap. We have a certification that you can earn for free. That's right, free. It's our foundational certification and it's called PinCap Certified TidyB Practitioner. This video covers everything you need to know to pass this exam. With that out of the way, let's get started. So we have a general introduction to TIDB, get certified fast, and that's the key. We want to get you certified fast, and that is how this was designed, to get you certified and fast. That said, it doesn't mean you're not going to know something when you get through with this training. Um, I think we do a good job of introducing TIDB, and you should be able to carry on valid conversations with TIDB people and PINCAP employees once you're done with this. So there is a huge benefit to this training. Let's discuss these benefits and what you'll be able to actually do once completing this. After watching this video, you'll be able to explain the benefits of TidyB Cloud to your friends and coworkers. You'll be able to explain the TidyB architecture to your friends and coworkers. And you'll be able to create a TidyB environment for learning. And you'll be in a great position to earn the TidyB Certified TidyB Practitioner credential. And this is a real certification you can even post it on LinkedIn. So here are our objectives again. Notice I've added the show everyone your new TIDB practitioner certification as the last objective and that's really important. We want you to get certified. All right, we're going to begin our journey with a simple question. What are the TIDB use cases? Okay, so why would you choose to use TIDB? That's a great question. So we have two broad categories here. The one on the left starts with scalable for mission critical workloads. So it's elastic and robust. It's MySQL, which means it's part of the MySQL family, which means you can use MySQL SQL when dealing with TIDB. And it's for massive business growth. So massive business growth is what really separates, <clears throat> excuse me, TIDB from a normal MySQL environment. So you wouldn't want to run your mom's website on TIDB because it's probably going to be really small. Unless your mom's running something like Amazon or Databricks or something like that. So we look to the left, we see horizontal scalability and that's seamless scale in, scale out at the component level. So we can scale storage and compute out separately. Go over to the right a little bit, zero downtime. So it can eliminate both planned and unplanned downtimes by using things like rolling upgrades and high availability. Uh, take a look at the lower left, strong consistency. We're an ACID compliant database, which means we can handle transactional loads at scale. And we do so in a distributed environment. And then the last one on the lower right, it's kind of funny, it's the lower right of the left, it is MySQL compatibility. So you can migrate from MySQL ecosystem with ease. Uh, you can even use some of the same migration tools and query tools to do this. But the big takeaway is that the MySQL, the SQL dialect that's used by My, MySQL and TidyB are compatible. They're basically the same. Basically, they're the same. We take a look at the right hand side of the diagram we see built-in translytical capability and this is simplified operational and analytical data services so let's begin we've already touched upon this or i i made a little side comment on dual engine row and column so empower real-time insights from hot and cold business data so hidden in here is that we have dual storage engines with tidyb we have a columnar store and a row based store and we'll go heavily into these later. Next, we have SQL on big data, and it's the renaissance of SQL to improve data agility. Um, you remember back a few years ago, Hadoop was all the rage, and it was very difficult because it didn't have great support for SQL. TidyB does. Hadoop and other so-called big data systems are also typically very difficult to install, configure, and manage. Uh, TidyB, on the other hand, is very easy to install, configure, and manage, so that's another difference. We move down to the left. We have one size fits all again. I'm not quite sure what this, what the intent of this was. Um, stolen, stolen slide. Um, but it encapsulates the complexity and reduced the reinvestment. So I, what I think this is talking about is that 
TidyB is very flexible. You can use it for OLTP, you can use it for analytics, you can use it for all sorts of things. And what this says to me is that with TidyB, you get to handle multiple use cases. So one size does fit all. And finally, if we slide over here to the right, we have zero ETL. And what does this do? Well, our slide says it lowers maintenance costs, and that's correct. You don't have to have multiple systems to do multiple workloads. So you don't have to have a system dedicated to do transaction processing and then another system that is there to handle you know, queries, like historical queries. Um, but what's hidden in here is that there's a layer between those two types of systems with ETL, which means a developer has to go in and write code to move data from one system to another so that you can get to both of them. Um, you don't have to do that here. You don't have to do any kind of ETL. Um, if you get back to our dual storage engines, it happens automatically. So we have replication in there that happens automatically. You don't have to do anything, which is nice. So this brings up a great question. What about workloads? We're going to discuss TidyB workloads here. So TidyB and TidyB Cloud. So you'll hear me say TidyB. When I say that, you can just assume TidyB and TidyB Cloud supports the following workloads. 24-7 availability with high I.O. activity. That's the transactional side. Next, it supports workloads that require sharded or partitioned data that routinely needs new shards. And it also supports them where shards disappear to make it um, a little more efficient. So what is a shard? A shard is just a way of dividing data so that it sits across servers or each shard sits on a specific server. Next, we have large database that is growing rapidly. That's important to remember. That's on the test is large database that is growing rapidly. So you're probably thinking, what does large mean? Well, we'll cover that in a little bit. And finally, database consolidation. Let's say you have 15 to 1,000 different uh, MySQL environments and you're tired of running and managing the software for all of them because each one has its own set of software. You can take those databases and move them into a single TIDB database and there, therefore you only have to manage one database install and it just makes it a whole lot easier. Okay, so 15 and 1,000, I just threw those numbers out there. They're meaningless, just as an example. Database consolidation is, we probably need to discuss it a little more. So database consolidation means combining multiple MySQL compatible servers into a single TIDB cluster. That's, that's the gist of what it means. You can also think of it as merging multiple sharded database schemas into a single TIDB cluster. That's another, another way to think about it. What's important though is that this is not a dataling model exercise. This is a lift and shift type of work. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's do something a little different here. Imagine you're sitting looking at your screen, watching the or looking at the certification questions, and you see one that asks something along the lines of, hey, do I have to manage all the shards and do I have to do manual sharding with TIDB? The answer is no. All this sharding stuff is happening behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything for it. And that's one of the main differences between TIDB and other MySQL family databases. So keep that in mind. This isn't on the exam, but we just want to point out that TidyB is trusted by global innovation leaders. Um, you'll, if you do a Google search, you'll see that Databricks uses TidyB for its infrastructure. Um, you can also go, if you're interested in it, this, go to that link at the lower right-hand corner of the screen. All right, with that in mind, let's talk about the MySQL family of database. This concept is pretty easy, so don't overcomplicate this. So what is the MySQL family? You won't hear this stated very often, but we do at PinCap call this the MySQL family. So to be in the MySQL family, a database must use the MySQL dialect of SQL. That means that the SQL that you use for MySQL is the same as TidyB, TidyB Cloud, Percona Server for MySQL, MariaDB, and one of the variants of Amazon Aurora, that is the MySQL variant. While it's important to have the same SQL, there's another, another attribute that we must have, and that's the database must be drop-in compatible with MySQL. 
That means you can substitute one database for another in an application and the application will continue to run. That makes it very easy to go to TidyB and TidyB Cloud. That's all well and good, but there is more to the story. So if the database is drop-in compatible with MySQL, it means a number of things. One, the SQL variant is the same that your users know. And it's drop-in compatible, which means you can change over, you can alter your application with little muss or fuss. Hidden in here, though, is another aspect. It means that your database administrators who are f familiar with MySQL and the tools surrounding it, such as the client and the uh, data transfer tools, they have a leg up, they have an advantage when it comes to learning about TiDB, TiDB Cloud, and other database variants based on MySQL. One thing that this doesn't mean is that the code base for the database is a fork of MySQL. For example, TiDB is definitely not a fork of MySQL. That is not important for something to be a MySQL family member. So important to keep that in mind. And I, some of this stuff is going to be on the exam. So don't make too much fuss over it. It's pretty common sense, but it is going to be on the exam. Alrighty, so we've talked about MySQL family. Let's begin discussing what makes TidyB different, and we'll do that by discussing TidyB architecture. Our diagram here is reasonably complicated, but we're going to discuss it a piece at a time, so don't worry. The first thing you'll notice that sets TidyB and TidyB Cloud apart from the other databases is that TidyB is built using components. Um, the, four look, the four colored boxes here show the various components TidyB uses. So let's go ahead and take a look at each one of those components. So we're back to our diagram and we're going to build our diagram a piece at a time. So TidyB, it begins with a connection. So if you look to the left here, you'll see an application. And that application is using the MySQL protocol to communicate with something. So a user will connect to TidyB as a, My, a MySQL application. That's important to remember. Not an Oracle application, not a, My, not a SQL Server application, not a DB2 application. Users connect to TidyB as a MySQL application, and that's part of being part of the um, MySQL family. So there's two ways to do this, or there's two categories of users. One is application users, the other is developers and programmers. The box in the middle is application users, and that's where most of us will fall. And actually, our DBAs kind of span both of them. But for application users, you usually don't care what you're connecting to, right? You're, you're there to get information, to do queries or whatever. You've got an application that connects. You usually don't care what you're connecting to. Next up, applications that can connect to MySQL can connect to TiDB. That, that's part of being part of the MySQL family. Um, you can use ODBC, such as Excel, Tableau, and others, and JDBC, Tableau, Looker, others, and APIs. Uh, they're MySQL admin tools that use direct APIs. If we move over to the developers and programmers, ODBC, JDBC, and various MySQL connectors, such as Python connectors and things such as that. So it all begins with a connection, and users connect to TidyB as a MySQL application. I know what you're thinking. What are you going to connect to? That's what we're going to discuss next. Okay, this is where it gets a little confusing. So I have up here TidyB runs SQL commands. What I should have up there is TidyB server runs SQL commands. So those TidyB boxes off to the left that are in the TidyB cluster are actually TidyB servers, and that's where our application will connect. So if we go back over to the bullets here, we say TidyB really server, TidyB server, is the name of the entire system and a component, which leads to confusion. So once again, TidyB server is the component, TidyB cluster or TidyB is the overall system. So you have to keep that in mind as you're talking to people. Next up, the MySQL client connects here. We've discussed that. And this component handles SQL requests. It performs SQL parsing, which means it's going to take the SQL that you pass to it, make sure it's valid, correct. It's going to compile it. And then the next bullet points out, it's going to generate a distributed SQL execution plan, which is basically telling TidyB how to get the data for the query. 
Uh, once it does that, it actually returns query results to the MySQL client. It's also stateless, which means if these go down, one of these goes down, the query that's running on that specific TidyB server is lost and has to be rerun, but queries that are running on other TidyB servers continue to run. And finally, this is one of the things that makes TidyB special and gets back to the way we do things with components. It's scalable. You can add or remove TidyB servers. So if your query demands go up, you can make them, you can add more. If they reduce, you can get rid of some of them. Really great. I'm, I'm going to mention it here. We'll talk about this more in a little bit, but TidyB server is the query component, which is compute. We'll, we'll talk about the storage component later. And because we use components, you can scale out query, TidyB, or storage independently of one another, which is a big deal and is definitely on the test. Speaking of storage, next we're going to talk about the TyKV server. So the TyKV server provides storage for the TidyB server component. It's row-based data store, and it's used for online transaction processing. That's OLTP data. Um, the data is distributed across multiple nodes, and it maintains multiple replicas. By default, there are three replicas of the data stored. And we also support high availability and automatic failover. Now, TyKV can be used without TyDB, but we're not going to talk about that, not on the test. That's a different use case. And surprisingly enough, TyKV, and that is ironic, TyKV uh, stores data in key value pairs. That's where the KV comes from. Speaking of storing data in key value pairs, let's take a look at how that happens. So it's pretty simple how we take um, relational data and map it to key value pairs. First, we create a key, and the pattern of the key is table prefix, which is a table ID with an underscore concatenated to a row ID. And this maps the table data to the key value pair. TyKV hosts a vast sorted key value map so that it can keep track of all this data. And when you do your table query, it can go and pull the correct key value for the data that it needs to go get. At the bottom of the slide, we have an example. And these are three rows of data from some table where the table number is actually 10. Um, so the first row of data there you have the first column entry is tidyb the second column entry is sql layer and the third column entry it just happens to be 10 that has nothing to do with the table so if we look at the table mapping we'll see that table 10 is t10 underscore r1 because that's row one and then the arrow means that it maps to the value tidyb sql layer, SQL layer and 10. Uh, let's take a look at the bottom one. So we have PD, we have manager, and the value 30. Once again, the table is table 10, so T10 underscore R3. Remember, this is the third row. And that maps to PD, manager, and 30. Okay, now let's take a little bit of a deep dive into TyKV. We're going to do some review and talk about multi-version concurrency control. So recall that TyKV is the storage layer, and by that we mean TyKV is responsible for making the data in the database permanent. Um, also, TyDB, the SQL processor, uses the KV API to talk to TyKV. This is important, right? Because we have separation between storage and compute the TidyB SQL processor represents compute and TyKV represents storage. The next bullet, not all SQL processing is performed by the TidyB component. This is the first time we've mentioned this. This pushdown is handled by the coprocessor. Um, we are able to push down such things as filtering, mapping, count, sum, and other things that can be spread across multiple machines down to the storage layer. What this means is it increases parallelism and actually can help by reducing the amount of data returned to the uh, TidyB server. TyKV also implements 
acid capabilities. Now we'll talk about those in a little bit, but that's the acid capabilities are basically what makes the database able to handle transaction processing at speed. TyKV uses Google's percolator module and uses optimistic locking for transactions. So that's what we're going to get into next. And that's where multi-version concurrency control comes in. A lot of databases that when they do updates, update the data in place. Uh, TyDB doesn't do that. Um, what it does is it uses MVCC to create a new version of the data object instead of updating it in place. So this is a difference between TyDB and other databases. Next bullet is current readers can see older versions while the update transaction runs. And the reason for this is that it creates a copy. It keeps the older copy, uh, uses timestamps so that it knows which is the newest one and which is the older one and can cycle through the older ones and report back. So it can do all this while update transactions run. And finally, MVCC does not require locking, which means that we can run multiple transactions and they don't stumble upon each other. At this point, you're probably asking yourself, how does TyKV persist data? And isn't that really important? Well, it turns out it is. And if we go down to the next item on our architecture diagram over there on the left, we see RocksDB. RocksDB is a persistent key value store. It is a component used by TyKV. We do not surface RocksDB directly, but we use it indirectly. So RocksDB is a persistent key value store. That means that the data is stored permanently. One of the cool things about it is not only does TyKV use RocksDB, it actually uses two instances of RocksDB. One for the key value pairs, the actual data that we're going to be querying and writing. The other RocksDB instance is used for raft logs and we'll talk about them next. So the raft algorithm is all about storage, so that's where we'll start. And we'll begin by saying that TyKV nodes, these are individual machines running TyKV, and usually in a production environment, or always in a production environment, there'll be more than one of these nodes. And these nodes store data in something that's called a store. So each TyKV node contains one or more stores. And a store is a TyKV process that manages data storage. So we've kept our diagram here reasonably simple. So we have four nodes and each one of them has a store. We have store one, store two, store three, store four, and they are on the corresponding nodes, TyKV node one, node two, node three, node four. And the client up at the top is not our MySQL client. It is going to be TyDB server, the SQL processing layer. That is the client for TyKV. So we've talked about stores. Now we're going to talk about regions. And the, a region is the basic unit of data movement for TyKV. And each region is copied to multiple nodes. So if you look at our diagram, you'll see there are regions all over the place on all four of our nodes, on all four of our, of our stores. So I have a question for you. How many regions are there on this diagram? Feel free to pause the video while you count. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see a lot of little boxes there. But if you count them, you'll count five regions. There's region one, region two, region three, region four, and region five. I know what you're thinking. Jeff, there are a lot more than five boxes on this diagram. So what's up with that? Well, TyKV replicates data. So we have five regions, but 15 different little boxes there. So you can discern by default, TyDB creates three replicas of data. So if you take a look at our diagram, using region four as an example, we can see region four has three replicas, one on node one, one on node two, and one on node four. So one of the things that you have to remember or that you should remember, well, you have to remember it for the exam, is that each replica is at most 96 megabytes. That at most is, is important. 
Um, what happens when a replica is much smaller than that? During idle times, TIDB may go through and combine it with another small replica so to reduce the replica count. What happens when a replica goes over 96 megabytes? Um, TIDB will split it so that it's in multiple replicas. Now, 96 and 3 are magic numbers and you should remember them for the exam. This all leads us to a very important question. How do we keep data in sync? How do we keep it consistent? And remember, I said we were about to discuss Raft, and it's been a long time, and we haven't discussed Raft, so it may be that Raft, the Raft algorithm, is how we do this. At this point in your TIDB journey, um, you're not you don't need to know a whole lot about the Raft algorithm other than it exists and that it is set up to solve this problem. It keeps all four of these replicas in sync so that each one has the same data in it. And the way it does that is via logging and a bunch of stuff that's really beyond what we're going to talk about here. For example, we have courses that talk about Raft for hours. Uh, I'm not going to do that to you today. So if if I ask the question or if the test asks the question. So if the exam asks a question similar to how does TIDB ensure that data is consistent across nodes, the answer would be the Raft algorithm. So at this point we've been discussing storage and that's how we got into the discussion of Raft. We're going to start back up with storage because TIDB is very unique in that it has two different storage engines. TIKV, the one we just talked about, is for transactional processing. We also have a column store and that's where we're going next. Okay, this slide was our jumping off point. Um, I wonder if there's something important on here. So if you want to pass a test, you, you may want to remember this. Data is stored in RocksDB, or TIKV, key value pair data is stored in TIKV. Um, there's also another set of data that's stored in TIKV. Remember, there's two uh, RocksDB inst instances in each TIKV node, and the other stores logs. So you want to remember that as well. If we look back to our storage cluster, we'll notice a lot of white space in that box. So there's something missing, and I mentioned it a minute ago, and that is a column store. Our column store is called tie flash, so let's go ahead and add it now. So if we look to the right of our diagram, we see tie flash server. So it also provides storage for the tidyb component. It's column or data store, and it's used for analytic data. The data, like uh, TIKV, is distributed, and data can be distributed across physical locations as yet. And this last bullet is wrong. It is absolutely open source now. There's some more really cool secrets about TIE Flash. The, one is, the first is, this isn't required. When I create a table in TIEDB, I have to explicitly say, um, create a TIE Flash component for it. And that's because uh, many of the tables don't require the analytics side, and we don't want to replicate data and take up extra space. There's an alter table command that you can issue in SQL that will absolutely create the tie flash replicas for you. And if you do a lot of big queries, you can immediately see that tie flash most of the time will help performance greatly. That takes care of the storage tier. So let's talk about the brains of this entire operation. What makes it all work together? And that would be the placement driver and because the environment needs a brain. So we see the placement driver up top there. We see PD, 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 there's three of them there. So the PD or the placement driver cluster contains the metadata for TIDB cluster for the whole thing. It allocates transaction IDs to distribute transactions. That's what makes this a distributed database. If you recall when we had the different TIKV nodes displayed in our diagram, the PD cluster using its transaction IDs distributes data across those nodes. Next, one PD cluster can, 
consists of at least three nodes. That at least is important and it is on the exam. You can have five nodes, you can have 10 nodes, 11 nodes, but you must have three nodes. And finally, the PD hosts a web server that runs the TIDYB dashboard. This is the management UI for TIDYB. Next up, let's talk about Ty Spark. Uh, at some point you're going to laugh, but at, up top there we have Ty Spark in memory analytics is a must have. We're going to find out that that's not entirely true. Um, the only reason we're showing this is because you'll see different diagrams and a lot of them have Ty Spark on there. So what is Ty Spark? Ty Spark is basically just Apache Spark running alongside of the database portion of TyDB. So as we can see on the bullet points here, TySpark query library runs Apache Spark SQL on TyKV, which means you can use Spark, Spark SQL to query your TyKV data. It integrates with the Spark Catalyst engine and it supports distributed writes to TyKV. Once again, this is not on the test. You don't have to worry about it, but it is kind of nice to know. Speaking of nice to know, TySpark is optional on self-hosted and self-hosted means you've installed the software yourself and you're running it either on your VMs in the cloud or hardware in your data center. And this is me trying to be cute. Actually, <laughs> actually optional on self-hosted and not available on TidyB Cloud. That is TidyB Dedicated and TidyB Serverless. Neither one of those supports TySpark. And if you need to know any of this for the test, it's optional on self-hosted and not available for, from the cloud product. That's TidyB Dedicated and TidyB Serverless. All right, let's move along from something that's not all that important to something that is very important. So we're back to user connection. So a user app connects to TidyB, and we can see that app on the left-hand side of the diagram in blue. It says, My App. Recall that um, the app is going to use the MySQL protocol, and it's going to connect to a TidyB server. We can see four of them in the box next to My App. Um, so the question you're probably asking yourself is, um, which one of those TidyB servers am I going to connect to? And don't they all have different IP addresses? So do I, as a user, have to know the IP address of every TidyB server in my TidyB cluster? And fortunately, the answer to that is no. We'll use a load balancer to make this easier because the load balancer is going to have a single IP address and then it's going to route connections to those various TIDB servers. So there is a little nuance here and this seems like it would be an excellent test question. Our first bullet, self-managed deployments do not include a load balancer. You or I, whoever is going to it, you know, install this thing has to install and configure a load balancer for us. Um, second, TidyB Cloud, serverless and dedicated, includes a load balancer. So let me read that again. TidyB Cloud, serverless and dedicated, includes a load balancer. You don't have to do anything. It just works. If I install my own software, I have to install and configure a load balancer if I need one, and that is on the test. So here's an updated diagram. On the left, we see my app. We see an arrow going both ways, uh, connecting to a TidyB server, and now it's running through a load balancer. And the load balancer will choose which TidyB server your app connects to. You don't have to do anything. And it will choose it based in a round robin method and it depends on how much load is on a TidyB server, but that's how this works. Once again, if you install it, you have to install the load balancer. If you're using TidyB cloud-based products, TidyB dedicated, TidyB serverless, PinCap handles that for you. Next, let's talk about TidyB SQL processing. So we'll return to our trusty diagram. So what we're talking about is what happens and where. 
Um, on the left hand side of the diagram you can see SQL processing happens here and that is the tidyb server layer, the tidyb cluster layer there. In order to really talk about SQL processing though we need a new diagram so here it is. This diagram is just a little bit more detailed, but it will make sense to you. Notice that the box in the middle is really just our TidyB server. It's going to be the portion that handles SQL processing. And then off to the right, we have our TyKV server or TyKV cluster. And finally, our Ty Flash cluster. Once again, we'll start off to the left. This is an application that is connecting to TyDB, and that is using the MySQL client. The client is going to use the MySQL access protocol to communicate with the TidyB server. With all this talk about MySQL, this is a great time to bring up the concept of the MySQL family. And in a nutshell, a user can connect to TidyB and think she is connected to MySQL. Um, that's one of the things that makes it makes uh, TidyB part of the MySQL family, or even creates a MySQL family in the first place. Is that there are many different databases that use the same protocols. And that statement, a user can connect to TidyB and think she is connected to MySQL, is very important. So the final little question down there, what are the implications of this? What are the implications of the MySQL family? It's very important. It means that if you're a MySQL user, you can plug and play TidyB into your environment and the application will work. Using a database that's part of the MySQL family gives you a flexibility that you can change out your existing MySQL infrastructure for something like TidyB when your needs grow. If you need distributed processing, TidyB will be there to handle it. Another aspect of this is if you take the time to learn MySQL, it makes the transition to something like TidyB a whole lot easier because the SQL layer is the same, the syntax is the same. You'll hear a lot of discussions about different components in the environments, and they'll be the same, like the client. Uh, we use the MySQL client with TidyB, so once you know how to use that, you're all good. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is that there are DBA tools and developer tools that work with MySQL, and they will certainly work with TidyB as well because TidyB is part of the MySQL family of databases. Let's go back to our diagram. So here we see the parser area. We see at top, we see parser, underneath logical optimizer, and finally physical optimizer. So what does this stuff do? <laughs> Naturally, it parses the SQL and optimizes the query. So the TidyB server actually validates that the SQL sent from the client to TidyB server is valid. That's what parses means. And it optimizes the query. It takes that valid query and figures out how to best satisfy it. And when we say satisfy a query, we mean get the correct answer back to the user as quickly as possible. The next thing TidyB server does is it communicates with our storage layer and accesses TyKV and TyFlash. This may come as a surprise, but it can access both TyKV and TyFlash within a single query. This is very, very powerful and it leads to really quick queries. It's not on the diagram, but TidyB server can access multiple TyKV nodes and multiple TyFlash nodes from within a single query. It's important to know, as we'll see here in just a second, there is a constraint on the actual TidyB server. Let's move back to the left-hand side of the diagram at the arrow between the client and the protocol layer. Are we missing something here? You have to know the answer is yes, or I wouldn't be showing this. Although TyDB server can connect to multiple TyKV or TyFlash servers, a single client connection can only connect to one TyDB server instance at a time. That's really worth remembering. A single client connection can only connect to one TyDB server instance at a time. 
And with that, we are finished with the new content. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through and do a thorough review of what we just learned. Um, this will help you remember things that are important. It'll give me a great chance to point out and say, hey, 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 this is on the test. You should remember it. So without further ado, let's do a thorough review. Okay, question one. True or false? I must install and configure a load balancer on a dedicated TidyB cloud cluster. So the answer to this is false. Remember, you must install a load balancer or you can install a load balancer if you install the TidyB either in your cloud data center using VMs or on-prem. If it's TidyB dedicated or TidyB serverless, PingCap does it for you. Question two, this is also true or false. TyKV server stores data in a columnar format. So this one is false. Remember, TyKV stores data in an OLTP type row column values type format. It's used for OLTP. Columnar is used for OLAP, or analytics processing. Question three, TyKV server uses what storage technology to make TyDB data permanent? The answer is RocksDB. Recall that there's two instances of RocksDB inside of TyKV. One handles the key value pair store and the other one handles logs. Question four, which TidyB component ensures the durability of data? The answer is TyKV server. Remember, TyKV server um, stores the key value pair, the data that's required by TyDB, the overall environment. And um, you can't have a TyDB environment without TyD or TyKV. On the other hand, TyFlash is the columnar store and it is optional. Question five, true or false, the TidyB Playground cluster launched by TyUp is adequate for production environments and or heavy workloads. Okay, this is embarrassing. I had to go back and check this video and I have not talked about this. I talked about this during the um, HTAP Summit presentation. So in order to explain this, I am going to bring a video from our YouTube channel. Um, it's less than three minutes long and it explains this adequately. I think it explains it pretty good, but take a look and we'll come back to this video. In this video, we're going to take a look at TidyB Playground. So it begins with a curl command and we'll issue that. And this is just to show uh, setting up the software, basically to get to that tie up playground. So let's type tie up playground and then watch what happens. So TyUp is checking for updates and shouldn't take many because we just installed this via the curl command. You can see it's starting PD instances, TyKV instances, TyDB instances, and the message waiting for TyDB instances ready is interesting because it's 127.0.0.1, which means localhost. So the question that we get most often is, can I use this playground <clears throat> excuse me, can I use this playground for production work? And when you start seeing 127.0.0.1 or local host, you really should understand that no, this is not for production work. Okay, at this point it's up and running. We can see a connection string that we could use to connect from a client to this TidyB instance. We can also see some URLs of the management consoles. So let's go ahead and hit control C to stop it and you'll see that it starts coming down pretty quickly and then there's some pieces of it that are a little slower to come down because it has to make sure things are copacetic so we're waiting for some things to quit and there we are we're back at our prompt the key takeaway here is that tidyb playground is not meant for production or work that has to be permanent so don't rely on it use it for learning and experimentation only Thank you for watching the video and please take time to subscribe to the YouTube channel. It would help us a lot. So as we saw during our brief video interlude, um, the answer to this is false. Uh, 
the tidyb playground runs on localhost which is 127.0.0.1 and it is absolutely 100 percent not adequate for production environments and or heavy workloads and by production we mean anything that you depend upon if you depend upon it you need to install or get a different type of tidyb question six true or false TIE Flash is useful for OLTP only workloads. This statement's false. Uh, TIE Flash is useful for OLAP or online analytics processing workloads. Remember, it's optional. OLTP only workloads would be TIE KV, and TIE KV is required. Question 7 Briefly explain why you must always have the same number of TIDB servers and TIKV servers. <laughs> well, you can't explain it because it isn't true. So in TIDB, compute and storage can be scaled independently. So this is very important. It means that I can, if I have, uh, if I need more query services, I can increase the number of TIDB servers. Uh, if I don't need as many, I can reduce them. If I need more storage capability, I can increase the number of TIE KV servers. And if not, I can reduce TIE KV servers as well. So separating of storage and compute is one of the hallmarks of TIEDB. Question 8. True or false? TIE KV is useful for OLTP only workloads. This is true. TIE KV is the key value pair. It's used for transactional data and useful for this type of workload. Question 9. Which ETL tool is recommended for migrating data between TIE KV and TIE Flash? Well, this is a trick question. Uh, ETL isn't required. TIEDB handles it all for you. I think I made one sentence on this during this video, and it's worth repeating again. TIE KV, the transaction side, TIE Flash, the OLAP side, um, TIE DB keeps everything in sync for you. You don't have to do anything. There's no manual migrating data from one to the other. This is one of the capabilities of TIE DB that makes it so easy to use. And finally, question 10. True or false, multiple TIDB server instances can participate in executing a single query. This one is definitely false. Um, each query is assigned to a single TIDB server, and that, sent, that TIDB server is responsible for that single query. Um, don't get confused. We said that a TIDB server can connect to multiple TIE KV servers to satisfy a query. We said a TIDB server can connect to multiple TIE Flash servers to satisfy a query. And we said that a TIDB server can connect to a combination of multiple TIE KV and multiple TIE Flash servers to satisfy a query. But the query can only be run on one TIDB server. So right now you're almost ready to get certified. Um, I would suggest that you watch the helper videos in the PINCAP learning channel. That's where you're seeing this video right now. And once you've done that, then you will be ready to take the certification exam and earn your certificate of recognition. So once you pass the exam, you will be a TIDB practitioner. You get to announce this on YouTube and you do get a real certificate, just like the one that you're seeing there. Signing up for the practitioner's exam is easy. You'll go to pincap.com slash education slash certification and you'll see that upper little icon, the uh, PINCAP certified TIDB practitioner. And then you'll click on start your journey to become a TIDB expert. And then you will click the register now button in order to register for the course. So the first thing you need to do is to look down at the bottom and make sure that the contents mention an exam. So it should mention exam, PINCAP certified TIDB practitioner exam information. And there's two other items down there. 
If you see that, then click the Get the Course button and fill it out and be on your way. I would really appreciate it if, um, if you would subscribe to the PinCap Learning Channel on YouTube. You can do that by going to youtube.com slash at sign then PinCap Learning. And once you get to that screen, you can say subscribe. And that way you'll know when new videos have been posted. Um, we're going to do another series like this one on the next certification exam as well. So stay tuned. So on behalf of myself, Jeff, and the rest of the PinCap Learning crew, I'd like to thank you for watching this video. Um, hopefully you'll take the next step and watch the helper videos in this YouTube channel. And once you've completed those, go ahead and take the exam. It's free. You can take it as many times as you want to. There's no shame or downside to taking it and failing it. So just give it a go. It's 20 questions and it shouldn't take you very long to do it. So good luck. And if you have any suggestions or comments, please feel free to place them on this video. Once again, Thank you for spending your valuable time with me. Goodbye.